So the title of my talk today, which you can should be able to read out now on the presentation on Zoom, is being a public church in the digital age perspectives from public theology. So what I want to do is trying to relate different um, topics I'm working on to get a better view on the intersection which is at stake in your conference these days, so the intersection of technology and theology. What I want to relate is digital spaces, public theology, and the question of public churches. In doing so, I might commit a mistake that any scholarly approach to a topic does. It opens up countless new debates. And at the first glance, that makes things unnecessarily complicated. But at the second glance, and I hope this will succeed and be also the, the case today, the perspectives intersect. And that might be possible to focus on the precise intersection we are interested in today. So the question, where and how can the intersection of theology and technology in today's church views that we can embrace the digital age for the flourishing of society and church is the question I want to answer from these three angles, public theology, public church, and the question what the digital age might contribute to that. I want to start with the broadest field, which is public theology, and I will try to keep it very, very short. So if you have any questions on that, you can come back to that later. I will secondly address the question on how and where and why churches are public and in which ways they are public to understand, thirdly, how these ways of being public are changed by and in the digital age. And on this basis, I will introduce some thesis of my understanding of being a public church in the digital age in the fourth part. So let me start with public theology. The term public theology came up in 1974 during the debates of civil religion in the United States. Martin Marty, a theologian of his time, used it to describe the work of Reinhold Niebuhr and said that Reinhold Niebuhr's work was an attempt to address issues of social public on the basis of biblical or dogmatic sources. And this is, is exactly what public theology is about since then, the question of how we can relate social questions, public questions on the basis of theological grounds understood as biblical or dogmatic issues. Since the 1990s, the term has spread worldwide in other contexts, as well as numerous contexts in the European field. Innumerable political, social, economic, and other issues are discussed under this name from a theological perspective ever since. And consistently, this debate comes back to the question of how this theology that is oriented in practices by its very concern can be fed exactly into public practices. Or to put it with the US American theologian Breitenberg, how to make public theology operational. Almost every theologian points to the church in this matter. It might be the easiest way to go. It is the church where public theology has its practices, its application, and its foundation. In contrast to other ethical efforts, for example, philosophical thoughts, theology has the particularity to be genuinely connected with an institution which is, by its nature, part of the public sphere. As Max Stackhouse, another U.S. American theologian, puts it, the importance of theology in social and ethical issues exactly rises from the fact that it has a social figure which forms an institutional counterpart to public theology. The church forms, and I quote, a social cultural manifestation of what people mean concretely when they say they believe in this or that creed or cult. So in the following, I will examine the ecclesiological dimensions of this public theology. So the question is, how does this work out? So how is church part of the public sphere? Do you have, is it working well with the audio? So do you hear everything all right? Because I have a little feedback loops from time to time. Yeah. Are you okay? Okay, so I will just ignore whatever I hear and go on. <laughs> 
So how is church part of the public sphere? Um, and I want to distinguish two ways. We have one, which is might be the, the first thing to uh, think about, which is I call the church in public. So the explicit ways of how churches are part of the public spheres. And I want to add to that, that the church is also a public in itself. So we have implicit functions of churches within the public sphere or into the public sphere, which are more and more important, I would say, when it comes to the digital age. So how is the church public? What does public church mean? Let me start with the explicit forms of public churches. I call churches in public. I see at least three ways of being a church in public. So firstly, the church's function in public can be described as advocacy. For Stackhouse, the church is the incumbent steward for the formulation of a new social gospel in the form of public theology. The German theologian Heinrich Bedford-Strom develops a similar understanding of the church's task of advocacy in the public sphere. For him, public theology offers a theological basis for the active engagement of the church in order to engage in the public realm consistently and rooted in its own tradition, it needs public theology. So in a way one could say theology is kind of the theory um, of being public church. And then you have the churches who are the practice or practices public practice public theology. How do they do that? Secondly, it's the way of social teaching. So this is a publicly spoken way of being church in public. The church as an institution, so the understanding offers general orientation on moral issues in the public sphere. Robert Benny, another Lutheran theologian, claims credibility, from comprehensibility, and considering the various levels of authority as key guidelines for these tasks. In German public theologies, these form of explicit action of the church is the most important implementation of public theology. So for example, Wolfgang Huber defines public theology as a theological project to interpret the questions of common life and its institutional design in their theological relevance and to determine the contribution of Christian faith in the responsible design of our world. So public theology in this understanding reflects on the work and the ethics of Christianity in the social public sphere, as well as the dialogical participation in thinking about the identity and crisis, the goals and the tasks of society. So as one institution speaking out on the social issues of the day, interpreting these kind of questions in the light of the theological tradition and then speaking out um, for others or with others or to others. These two understandings of being a church in public sometimes come together in the understanding of a public church. So what does this mean being a public church? It was again Martin Marty who evolved this concept of a public church linked to public theology. Public churches, Marty says, are particularly involved in the res publica, so in the issues who are, which are at stake in the common um, life the churches share with the other people. When a public church reflectively examines and critiques ex existing social practices and cultural understandings in the lights of its religious insights, it practices public theology. And in this understanding, doing public theology as a church cannot be um, separated from being the church. So this is what the term public church tries to highlight. So um, you can't, that you can't separate um, these two issues from one another. We have similar insights um, by the Catholic theologians, Kenneth and Michael Himes, um, US American theologians, um, I have a quote on the slide here. So the public church's direct task, they say, is to build up the public life of a people. So here, public church is directly linked to the question of um, the flourishing of a society. And we have a similar concept by um, Wolfgang Huber from the Lutheran tradition in Germany. And this understanding of public church, in a way, links my two dimensions of um, describing how churches can be public, being church in public and being publicly 
a church. So let me come to this second dimension, the church as the public and the evolving implicit forms of public church, which evolve from this understanding. The first part, uh, the first section um, on, on being a public as a church or being church as a public means that to understand church is a space where one can learn something about public issues and about the way of dealing with them ethically. We have in Germany in the in the debates on public church, we have this uh, a term Lernraum, so it's a space of learning, um, which I, I like pretty much in this um, dimension. One can be affirmative about the um, the understanding of these kind of Lernraum, these spaces to learn about ethics, or critically, you find both in the traditions of public theology. Very affirmatively, Max Sackhaus describes the church as a space of ritual and cult, which offers a place to search for truth and communion with God, and which therefore offers intrinsic symbolic character, which one can use for a to develop a sacramental sensibility, Stackhouse says, for issues in society. Public theology, Stackhouse says, needs to consider this sacramental sensibility to strengthen community in society. So for Stackhouse, the churches are a place where you can learn about how being a communion, how, uh, how to share spaces, how to um, discuss about questions you're dealing with in daily life with a special sensibility um, for others. Another US American theologian is a little more critical um, on this issue, Ronald Thiemann. He describes the church as a space for ethical discourse, but in an antagonistic connection between the ecclesial community and the societal communities. Thiemann characterizes this compound as loyalty and criticism. So since the church is part of the long-term structure of civil society, it can offer continuous support and criticisms of liberal institutions. And it's not the only thing um, to do to affirm like sensibilities for society in within the church's spaces, but also being a connected critic, he says, to the society surrounding us. How could these way of learning or these, these dimension of learning um, be fed into society? And um, I see two different ways which are described in the debates of public theology, um, which are the individual believer or the structure of the church. So um, the individual believer um, is one of the most important connections between the spaces to learn inside society, uh, inside the churches, um, and then bringing this into society. Again, it is Max Stackhouse who describes the believers as the first, he calls it reference, public theology, because every change in society bases in changes of personal beliefs, he says. Given that believers shape their surroundings, the sanctification of individuals offers a unique potential for changing society. Sackhouse calls this the inside out approach. The believer shapes society in their personal spheres of life from the inside out, just as the church as an institution influences the society. But then this is not all we should think about when we talk about um, the church is as public as it's also the structure of the church. So the institution, the institutional ways of being church, which form witness to society. For Robert Bennett, the vision of God's society is embodied or can be, maybe should be embodied in the shape and in the behavior of the church himself. Similarly, Stackhouse unfolds this implicit function of the church in relation to their covenantal structure. It can form a model, it can form even, Stackhouse has, an avant-garde of the federal liberal society. He's coming from the reform tradition, so you hear a little um, the notion of um, the covenant from this tradition in here. So that the church takes a specific, a special responsibility for using its opportunities also structurally. And I think this is an interesting angle and in also dealing with the question of how to use um, ecological data, for example. And we'll hear a little more about this in the talk um, afterwards by Christian Schertz. 
So how are all these ways of doing digital, um, public theology and doing public church related and affected by the digital age? Talking about digital world and public theology means, first of all, I want to think about the digital spaces and the digital age as a new context, a new space for and in public theology. Digital media create new spaces stru structured by digital theology, I'm sorry, digital technologies constitution, uh, constituting interactions of information on communication. These virtual spaces exist separate and partly interfere with analog spaces. You're all familiar with the notion of the hybrid spaces and that's what we, I wanna think about um, in the next minute. So these hybrid spaces are not only hybrid um, in terms of technology, but also in a cultural sense. It connects the digital with the other forms of daily life and even more, there are no other forms of daily life which are not affected by um, digitalization in a way. In the cultural sense, I think a very good description is coming from the Swiss media scholar Felix Stalder, who talks about the hybridization and consolidation of the digital in all areas of the field. So what we have to, or what I want to think about when I think about the relation of public theology, public church, and the digital, is not to address specific ethical issues related to digital technologies, but rather I want to think about public theology itself. So thinking about how these describe relations between publicness and church, publicness and theology, church and theology um, change if they enter digital spaces, if one tried to understand them in the digital age. And I think uh, with all of you, I don't need a lot of um, explanation on the issue of digital itself. I want to highlight three ways of governance I see shaping digital spaces, technical governance, economic governance, and social governance, which for me are the most um, decisive for the shaping of digital theology. So let me start with the technical governance. Communication and interaction in digital spaces are essentially structured and guided by algorithms. So, and, and the way data is um, constituted and spread around. Much has been written about the algorithmic ar architecture and a lot has been written about data hermeneutic um, in digital spaces. So let me just very briefly point out the points um, I refer to when I think about my theological understanding. So that would be first that algorithms are gatekeepers of digital publics. They not only structure the information as we see it, but they provide the corridors in which we can see and communicate based on the uh, infrastructure we're using at the moment. Algorithms thus creates corridors of attention and structure social practices. Secondly, these corridors of attention lead to a continuing pluralization and segmentation of publics. These processes have been widely discussed and are still discussed um, empirically. Um, you know, all know the um, description of the survival and all the other um, theories around these kind of personalized information and inter interaction um, publics. But what we see here, which is specific interesting coming from the um, debate on public theology, is that these kinds of, of bubbles or um, interpersonal networks form a way of publics which we were not used to see um, before we had like um, the, the print public um, public private distinguishing the um, we had before. So thirdly um, talking about publics in this context we have to take or I want to take into account these are personal and fluid publics. They are changing constantly and never are never the same today and tomorrow. So we have communication networks provided by the algorithms and the algorithms themselves construct a way of um, reality we perceive as the public we speak to when we enter digital spaces. The German theologian Christine Merle states, and I want to quote her here, the world the algorithm presents is not a representation of real settings, but rather an individualized usage data responsive construction 
based on specific parameters whose nature and interaction are generally withdrawn from users. So this leads to the second form of governance I call the economic governance. You all know algorithmic structure is neither a coincidence nor an end in itself, but it is an expression, um, expression of the power structure lying behind. The Austrian media and culture scientist Ramon Reichert points out the users acting autonomously on the surface are controlled heteronomously by the algorithmic structure of the user interfaces. The hierarchical order thus takes place between back end and front end. Digital power structures, um, again, are a very, very broad field. And I just wanna refer to uh, one of the most famous works in this issue by Shoshana Suboff. The former Harvard economist Shoshana Suboff shows an impressing detail that this structure is not about direct profit, but about the capitalization of user attention on the one hand, um, and on the other hand about this, aiming to describe user profiles and meet them as accurate as possible in order to sell them or use them to influence economic, political, and social behavior. At the same time, we have in the digital field, not only these kind of power structures deeply um, shaped by the large, um, the large providers, but also we have nonprofit or other paid platforms where we see a different, almost contrary picture, which give the understanding of public and the governance of knowledge in these publics a very specific angle. In my field, um, specifically in the scientific communities, what we can see there is that nonprofit um, platforms or scholar-led paid platforms for scientific um, endeavor show that scientific communities became more permeable. At the same time, they compete with others for the attention of digital users. Therefore, as the German theologians Benedikt Friedrich, Hannah Reichel, and Thomas Reinhardt state, platforms and networks fulfill more and more functions which previously belonged to institutions, certificates, and authorship. And I think this might also be interesting for thinking about digital public churches, because we have a completely different dynamic into in these platforms than we are used to if we think um, from an institutional way of um, community building or sharing knowledge. Secondly, the importance of single or smaller groups for the aggregation of knowledge increases. Therefore, the digital forms of aggregating knowledge lead to discussions about the subjectivistic paradigm of epistemic individualism. What I see is that the, the ways of epistemic individualism, so, so thinking for oneself, evolving a thought, writing a book, and trying to contribute in this uh, way to a social discussion is not working very well on these kind of platforms. But what we need and what we see and what is working well is that we, if we can um, establish epistemic communities. So communities which are deeply um, shaped by the network approach of gaining knowledge and sharing insight. So we have both, I'd say, in the field of economic governance. We have these kind of um, economically driven platform capitalism kind of things. And we have these community-based epistemic communities, which we can use if we want to involve in digital public spaces. And the last aspect of the social governance refers to a third level, which is touching um, the other two, which is more thinking about the users um, and the perspective coming from them. Many digital spaces are focused on participation and interaction. Providers and users of content are often in inseparable. Users write or read at the same time. They share, they moderate. The Australian media scholar Axel Bruns coined the neologism prod user for that, and I think it's still very useful to describe these kind of structures. The structure creates fluid participatory discourse. As a result, public communication is changing from, and I quote Christoph Neuberger, is socially selective, linear and one-sided, to participatory, network-like, and interactive communication. Additionally, 
In social networks, probably another platform such as blogs, one sees a peculiar connection between content and identity. I am what I like. The digital self is constituted by its visualized interconnection. Interactions are therefore highly influenced by private content and part of a public debate. And this also um, touches the, the old separation between public and private, which we are very still very familiar to work with when it comes to religion and, and church issues. Christine Merle, again, the German theologian Christine Merle, therefore proposes to conceptualize the public as an intermediary and integrated network public with a dynamic character. So public, and I quote, is not a pre-existing entity, but rather a product of social, social circulation through various forms of media. So I promised you uh, that I try to gain some insights at this intersection of my description of theology of public church and um, digital public spaces. And I want to do so in raising four statements on the question how to be a public church in the digital age. And I hope that they will serve us for further discussion. So the first, I'd say digital spaces create plural fluid publics. They thus expand the concept of publicness and at the same time lead it at absurd. The understanding of public, which I just um, described, referring to the social governance issues, touch upon a very central concept of public theology and of public church as well. The fact that digitalization brings with it massive changes and the concept of public is hardly surprising in subject of many debates. And I would say it is kind of um, leading the whole discussion at absurd. Because what we see here is that we don't can't distinguish anymore between, between public and private, but what we can see is that we have different levels and, de levels and degrees of publicness of one's um, life in the digital spheres. The fact that public theology has to address not one, but many publics has been long aware to their representatives. But in digital spaces, the new question arises of how to deal with seemingly infinite public spaces. And within these infinite public spaces, I think um, we have even to ask whether um, these fluid personal spaces of interaction really are a public or what, how we can address these more properly in order to distinguish of what we want to might want to hold between private personal and beliefs and being publicly religious or being public church. So questions for public theology and public church arise like what does public theology mean if the publics are formed as a communication network which is constantly being created and changed in the course of the digital interaction. And these touches on all the ways um, I uh, propose to you of understanding publicness in public church. Secondly, might be even part of the first in a way, theology and the public are not opposed to one another. On the contrary, public theologies are constituted in and by publics. Public theology is therefore to be reformulated at the most at a mo as a mode of discourse. So if it's true that public communication is changing from socially selective linear and one-sided communication to a participatory network-like network interactive communication, as I described above, the demarcation of theology and its public or the demarcation of church and its public might be not sustainable. Therefore, theology and the public or church and the public are not opposed to one another, but they are constituted by each other. Following this, the publics are by no means a subordinate counterpart of church or a subordinate counterpart of theology. Public church can not be developed independently or outside of its publics and then be carried to a public as we are still doing in a way uh, when we have these kind of um, uh, social interaction or or um, all these kind of things. Rather, the public 
more aptly the publicness of church or theology is constituted by the process of theological thinking, discussion, and action itself. Public theology thus becomes a dynamic process of becoming more and more public or maybe becoming less and less public, um, depending on what you want to do. Public and theology thus, in my understanding, become adjectives or even more aptly adverbs of a cooperative and participatory process instead of like static poles of assumed recipients. So that you have the church on the one side who's producing anything of public interest, putting it into another field, which is the public. That has deep influences and challenges the way on how we do public theology and how we are public church, I'd say. And what I would suggest and that uh, is the third statement that theological discourse in the digital space is a testimonial discourse closely relating content and identity for theological reasons. The close connections between content and identity I described above is surprisingly similar to the Christian concept of witness and testimony. So I am um, what I like is not something which is only true in social media, but in a way is also true um, for all Christians witnessing through their faith. Spreading the message of the gospel, the content cannot be separated from the identity of the proclaimer. Therefore, theological discourse is testimonial discourse closely relating content and identity for theological reasons. Understanding public theology as a theology, the theology of witness has two major consequences. The first thing, witness is always content. The Brazilian theologian Rudolf von Zinja argued, argued referred to the kenosis of Christ, public theology is, for theological reasons, kenotic self-restraining and self-critical. The second consequence is raised in the last statement. And so far as the Christian witness is constituted collectively, public theology can be understood as a collaborative practice. The participatory and network-like structures of most digital communication spaces makes it inevitable to practice a participatory and interactive public theology in digital spaces. And this is also very similar to the understanding of Christian witnesses, because Christian witness also is always part of the communion of Christian witnesses in time and space. Christian witness and its theological reflections can therefore be described as a participatory and collaborative production of the whole body of Christ. Subject of such a theology, and therefore not only a few experts, but all Christians in decentralized networks. And I would say one of the major tasks of being a public church in the digital age is to build up possibilities for these kind of decentralized networks of collective witness in digital spheres. Together with some colleagues, I tried to start it like a, a project on that with a theological open access journal called Cursor. And what we develop there is um, a model of theology we call citizen theology. So it is taking up insights from citizen science and relating it to theology um, and describing it at the very first task, every theology. Um, to establish more collaborative, participatory, and exploratory practices of Christian science, of theology. And this is exactly what I um, think might be a way to go to, towards being a public church. And now I've talked a lot and I can't see your faces, so I don't see whether you're still following me or it's time for a break, but I want to come to an end with very brief um, conclusions. So what does it mean to be a public church in the digital age referred to all these things I um, tried to develop in the last 30 minutes? I think one issue is that it means to be aware of the various forms of publicness of church and theology. Um, so not thinking firstly or mainly about the institutional forms we are used to think about mostly as far as I can see. see it. Um, but also thinking about all these implicit ways of how churches, how theology become public in the digital years.
I think it means, secondly, to embrace digital technologies as means of these forms of publicness and also to train to see um, where we have also, where we already have like close relations. And I think thinking about um, testimonial theology and public witnesses of the church um, and the Christians is a way to embrace the possibilities digital technologies offer um, as means for these forms of publicness. And thirdly, it means also to be aware of the structures, possibilities, and traps of digital media and technologies in their uses in the church. And we'll hear a lot more about that um, from the second speaker. So I'll just leave it like that. I hope that following this understanding, public theology and public church not only contribute to a reflection of digital spaces in the context of theology, but also help to theolo theologically shaping them. And at the same time, I hope that we might be encouraged by thinking about the digital space um, to think about how church could be like and how theology could be like fitting into these um, digital spaces and helping to flourish into the digital ages. So these are my thoughts on the issue. I thank you so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to our discussion. If you have any further questions, you find my email on here and I'm happy to get in touch. Thank you.